Okay. I can introduce myself, don't worry. Yes, please. Okay, my name is Zohar from the Simon Center. I'll talk about line defects and renormalization group flows. Um, thanks so much for letting me speak uh, in this nice format. And um, please interrupt me if you have any questions at any point, just uh, if, feel free to interject. Um, so I'll talk about work that appeared very recently, um, just like a month and a half ago with Gabriel Cuomo and Avia Raviv Moshe. And uh, the second part of the talk will be some work that's still in progress. Uh, we'll start writing it up soon with the same authors and also Mark Mazet, <clears throat> who will be joining Oxford, uh, I think, next year. So let me just give a very, very quick introduction, which is absolutely not necessary in this audience. So the subject of uh, one-dimensional defects or line defects has been extremely productive uh, in the history of physics. I think the renormalization group essentially came out of studying the Kondo effect, which is a line defect um, in a chiral theory in two dimensions. Um, I think that's how Wilson uh, found the renormalization group, as far as I know the history, uh, by thinking about the low temperature limit of the conductivity in some metals. And obviously, it later turned out somewhat ironically that this model is also integrable, so you don't even need renormalization group. And um, this was done by Nathan Andre, Velik, Wigman, and lots of other authors. So it's a subject that connects uh, integrability, renormalization. And the main, uh, at least that's as far as I know the history, my knowledge may be incomplete. So the main point of this talk is to explore one dimensional defects uh, in higher dimensional. Uh, quantum field theories, so not necessarily in 2D, but the defects would always be one dimensional. So a one dimensional defect has two ways. You can think about it in two ways. One is more like a Euclidean field theory approach where it's just a one dimensional defect. Uh, it's like an extended operator, like a line operator. But the way condensed matter people think about line defects is that you make a space like slice and the line extends in time. And then you can think about it as an impurity. So you have some many body system and there is some impurity which breaks translational invariance because of its existence. So these two point views are, these viewpoints are of course equivalent and I'll be going actually back and forth. Sometimes I'll say impurity, sometimes I might say line defect, but these are the same things by the Euclidean rotation. By weak rotation, these are all connected subjects. So we'll talk about line defects in higher dimensional theories. And for convenience, uh, the higher dimensional theories that I'll be talking about today are always going to be conformal. So the bulk is always going to be conformal and the line defect could or may or may not be conformal. I'll exactly say what that means. So in condensed matter language, that means that we tune the bulk to a quantum phase transition and we put some impurity. The impurity may or may not be critical. You may need to go to long distances to do some renormalization for the impurity to flow to some kind of critical point. Okay, so these are uh, the condensed matter viewpoint or the high energy physics viewpoint on the subject. And just to set the terminology straight. And there are lots of constructions. This is a very, very partial list. And in this audience, there, there are lots of experts who've uh, contributed immensely to the construction of various line defects in lots of different contexts with supersymmetry, without supersymmetry. My slides are very thin on references. Uh, I apologize for that, but there will be some. So obviously Wilson and Hoof loops are extremely familiar line defects. We can think about them as impurities which carry magnetic or electric charge in condensed matter language. Twist defects, it's a subject that will not come up much in this talk. I can explain what it is if there is interest. SPT defect is something that I will talk about in the second half of the talk. Also, if you're familiar with topological quantum field theory, the main observables in topological quantum field theories are not local operators because there are no local operators other than the unit operator in topological theories by definition. Instead, it's various extended operators which are supported on lines or surfaces. In particular, the most famous example is of course the world lines of anions, which are line defects in two plus one dimensional topological theories. And there are tons of other examples which I've uh, not listed. <clears throat> 
So there will be two, two parts to this talk. First, I'll talk about very general claims on renormalization group flows on line defects. So we'll assume that the bulk is conformal at the critical point, and we'll study what happens to these impurities, so to speak. And the second part will be some approach that we're developing now. It's still a work in progress for some kind of notion of heavy line defects. In the language of Wilson loops, these are Wilson loops in a very high representation. And there is also an, a counterpart for what heavy means for SPT defects and various other things that I'll mention today. I'll try to give some applications uh, in both cases, sometimes even pretty close to experiment. So let me just uh, set the set, set the stage with some uh, concrete uh, definitions. Uh, so the bulk will always be a d-dimensional conformal filter, as I said. Uh, and we'll consider a straight line in this conformal filter. You can think about it as a Euclidean theory for now. So this straight line can preserve some subgroup of the conformal group of the bulk. And the maximal subgroup that you can hope for, that you can hope to preserve in the case that the line defect is non-trivial is dead. Of course, if the line defect is trivial or it has some decoupled modes, you can preserve the full conformal symmetry of the bulk because you can't you won't even see the line. But if the line is trivial, is non-trivial that's essentially the biggest uh, subgroup that preserves the location of the line. And that's what you would call a conformal line defect. So a conformal line defect is anything that preserves this subgroup or more. There is a technical assumption here that the, that the, line, that the impurity or the line defect has no transverse spin. So it's invariant under SOD minus one. This is not essential for many things I will say, but I'll assume it just for the simplicity of some formulas. Okay, and the condensed matter language, we say that this is the symmetry preserved by impurity, which has flown to its fixed point. So it's a critical impurity in space. Uh, that's the picture, very unsophisticated. So you have a CFT, a line, a one dimensional defect, which extends in time. Okay, let me just define a very abstract observable. So if you're an experimentalist and you talk about impurities, you have very clear observables. You can measure energy density, you can measure correlation functions on the defect, outside of the defect, and so on. There are lots of observables which are very clear. I'll try to I'll define an observable which is very non-obvious. It's not intuitive and it's not even clear how to measure it. Yet it's an intrinsic observable of a line defect. So the definition is that instead of thinking about a straight line, we'll make the line into a circle. This makes very little sense in Minkowski signature, but in Euclidean filter, it makes perfect sense. We'll make it into a circle and we'll compute the logarithm of the expectation value of the circle. That's log L. And then the expectation value of the circle might have some radius dependence. So the radius of the circle. So you apply this differential operator and this, is, this object is going to be defined as G or the defect entropy. So this is something that I'll call the defect entropy. Now, let me make a few comments about it. If the defect is conformal and the ambient theory is conformal, you might expect that it, there is no R dependence. So it might be confusing of why I'm applying this differential operator because this should not be radius dependent. But the point is that there is some ambiguity, scheme, scheme ambiguity. So by changing renormalization group schemes, you can introduce something which you can interpret as mass renormalization of the impurity. So the, the physical mass of the impurity is just an arbitrary parameter that affects nothing. You can just add a cosmological constant term on the world line of the impurity, and that would introduce some linear dependence in the radius of the circle. And this linear dependence on the radius of the circle is uh, something that uh, is removed by this differential operator. And that's why only after you've acted with this differential operator, you can really say that you have a scheme independent intrinsic observable of the conformal field theory. Okay, so this is a nice observable that you can study for conformal line defects and even non conformal line defects, which I'll talk about soon. So we'll call it the defect entropy. I could okay. ask, uh, so just to link to something uh, we know, if you have an equals four and uh, supersymmetric uh, circle of Wilson line, what is G in this case? Is it zero? Can you, uh, what is what in this case? S or G? Let's see. Well, uh, isn't it the same thing? Uh, Yes, uh, it's the same thing. Uh, it's non-zero. This is the expectation value of a circular Wilson loop, as I'll emphasize, was computed by Drucker and Gross uh, 20 years ago. Uh, 
and it's a highly non-trivial function of n and lambda which we know from localization it's conformally equivalent to a wilson loop on the equator of a four-dimensional sphere that peston localized it's a non-trivial function but also the rambo right uh, yes of before. course there is a yeah I, i'll have the references soon there is a previous paper of the rambo of course yes so it's a non-trivial function of the coupling constants of the bulk cft and also it's a non-trivial dependence on the representation of the line so it's just basic function or already okay you mm -hmm. the, this particular quantity is uh, just a basic function or a ratio of basic functions yes you're correct in n equals four it's uh, at this i function mm -hmm. yes it's the Bessel function <clears throat> there are some subtleties with a straight line yes I mean, yes I mean, notice that here i'm defining this object for a circular line for an experimentalist in condensed matter it's hard to imagine how you would measure it because they cannot make time euclidean but this is a very nice observable anyway and you're right that i'm not going to discuss the straight line if you try to compute the partition function of a straight line you get into all sorts of difficulties because you have to be very careful about infinity for the circular line, there is no issue because you just sum over all the states on the line and it's a finite uh, observable, which is well-defined. Yeah. Okay, this is an interesting, very abstract observable of a DCFT. An important comment is that it's not the same as entanglement entropy. So let me just uh, tell you something that maybe some of you are interested to know. Um, in two dimensions, if the bulk is one plus one dimensional, you can easily prove that the expectation value of a circular line is the same as the entanglement entropy of the impurity in the condensed matter language. So when you have an impurity in space, you can surround the impurity with an interval and ask what is the entanglement entropy of the interval with the impurity versus the entanglement entropy of the interval without the impurity. And in one plus one dimensions, there are papers of Cassini and others that I'll cite, which show that it's the same as G or S. In higher dimensions, it's not true. So this object is not the entanglement entropy of the impurity. Now, this observable G is very familiar from N equals four, as the uh, Kolya uh, already anticipated, but it's also very familiar to people who do topological quantum field theory. Because in topological quantum field theory, uh, this object G is called the quantum dimension. And in topological quantum field theory, you can even prove an inequality that this one point function of the circle is always greater than one, greater or equal to one. And when it's one, we call it a billion anions. This is some terminology from a condensed matter. Or in high energy physics, we call it a one form symmetry. Anyway, uh, I'm just saying that this is an observable that's familiar also from topological quantum field theory when we discuss the line defects. Now, if you just discuss general quant the, general, the general case, which is non-topological in the bulk, we can only say that G is positive, non-negative, uh, <clears throat> by using CPT, because uh, G is some partition function on a circle and it obeys some positivity. But there are examples where G is definitely not bigger than one. There are nice constructions of conformal line defects, uh, which you can make into a circle by conformal transformation, where G is not bigger than one. Sorry, but final... here you assume a unitarity or something like that because it's a yes. function you can do whatever you want to... yes unitarity implies the g is positive not negative but it does not imply that g is bigger or equal to one why would you have expected that g would be greater than one all right so if you have a line you can the the simplest line defect that you can imagine is the one that doesn't exist trivial no impurity so this is called the trivial line defect it's just there is nothing you, you call the, the line is essentially nothing. It's completely transparent. For the nothing line, obviously this is one because the expectation value of the line is one. So it's one. So you might've thought that the trivial line, which is uh, the, non, the line that doesn't do anything is the bottom, that the G cannot go below that, but it's not true. Also in topological quantum field theories, as I said, G is bigger or equal to one. And that's been proven at least for unitary topological filters. I'm just saying that in general, it's not true. In general, this is all that you can get from unitarity. This is not necessarily true. Isn't there a log there? So log of one is zero. There, wh where's, the, where's the log? Sorry. Log I mean, of 
log of the expectation value? Yes. Oh, oh my God. I, there is a log here that I forgot. There is a typo in this equation. Let me write it down, then I'll fix it. The right hand side of this equation should be log G. I'm sorry for that typo. It's a very bad typo. So here it should be log G. Okay. So one last piece of terminology that I won't actually need very much is that there is something that's called the displacement operator. So the displacement operator is whenever you have a, a line, you can just wiggle it a little bit. You can create a little bit of a bump and that corresponds to a local operator on the line. So there is a local operator on the line with protected dimension that uh, creates little bumps and we call it the displacement operator. And technically we say that the line is topological if this operator vanishes. So sometimes like the trivial line is an example when there is a nothing, then obviously there is no displacement operator. Uh, but more generally, when the displacement operator vanishes as an operator, we say that the line is topological. I'll uh, skip this comment. Okay, so you can ask what are the operators on line defects? Given that this is the symmetry that the line defect preserves, operators are classified by these quantum numbers. So every operator has some uh, quantum numbers under SL2R times SLD minus one. So you can just label operators by, by their dimension, which is the Cartan of SL2R, and by the transverse spin. So the extreme example is again a trivial line defect. It's a line where there is nothing, and the space of local operators on the trivial line is just the space of bulk operators restricted to the line. So it's a, uh, but in more general line defects, such as Wilson loops, the space of line operators has nothing to do with bulk operators. It's just a different space of operators. So in general, the space of local operators on the line is a complicated subject. In some special cases, like the trivial line defect, we know the space of local operators. Okay, so now we start, we, we can imagine starting from a, a conformal line defect, a conformal line defect, um, which preserves SL2R times SOD minus one. And suppose we have found an operator, which is relevant. So it's scaling dimension is smaller than one. An operator is relevant on a line defect if its dimension is smaller than one, since we've, we are integrating over one space dimension. So then we can add it to the action. So we can now, the impurity is now set to undergo some renormalization group flow, and there is a scale, which is called M0 in this, no, in this notation. So M0 becomes the physical scale of the flow, and there is some renormalization group evolution uh, on the line defect. You can still consider the defect entropy. It's still an interesting observable, but now it has a non-trivial dependence on the, on the radius of the circle. So before that, when the line was conformal, this was just a pure number because uh, it's essentially a radius independent, uh, this, the expectation value. But now this is a non-trivial function of the radius. And when you take the radius to be very small, you're probing the ultraviolet of the defect. And when you take the radius to be very large, you're probing the infrared of the defect. So we can, uh, by dimensional analysis, it must be a function of only the mass scale of the flow times the radius of the loop. And the two limits are called GUV and G infrared. And again, I made the same unfortunate typo. It should be log GUV, log G infrared. Sorry, Zohar, you're saying this is completely unrelated to the G function? I mean, in the context of the two dimensional Ludwig Affleck and up. I'll go, I'll get back to that. So far, my, dis uh, my discussion now is in, uh, I'm talking about line defects in B dimensions. I'll get back to the question of the equals two soon. Yeah, okay, because I'm wondering if you can understand the flow. Okay. I'll get back to the equals, the special case of the equals too soon. I'm, uh, the, okay. So far, it's very general and it applies in any number of dimensions. It also applies for Wilson loops in four dimensions. Okay. Can, you can, I, define can I ask part. a general naive question? Um, if you add such an operator to the bulk theory, is it clear that the bulk theory does not change at all? Oh, meaning, perfect. you know. Yeah. Uh, so it's a very good question. It's not naive in, by any means. This operator is integrated on the line defect, not in the bulk. You see, there is only one integral. So this integral mm -hmm. is over the word line of the line defect. We integrate this operator on this line. Yeah. So it does change the bulk. But if you go very far from the line, then it doesn't change the bulk. Mm 
what do I mean by that precisely? If you mathematically, in the presence of an impurity, one point functions can be non-zero because now there is a distance from the impurity. Even if the defect is completely conformal, the one point functions could be non-zero because you could write one over distance to some power. Sure. But if you take the distance to be very large, it will always decay. So you'll get as close as, as, you, as you wish to answers in conformal field theory in D dimensions. So correlation functions near the defect will be modified, but far away, they will be very little modified. I mean, I yeah. guess if I just put on my D-brain hat, uh, sometimes the D-brain can completely distort the geometry. Right, it depends on the co-dimension. Yeah. So here, the defect lives in a D-dimensional CFT. Yeah. And if you assume unitarity in the bulk, mm -hmm. then all the one-point functions must decay by dimensional analysis. But, you know, the eight brains and the seven brains are bad. That's and right. That's because it's a, that's right. That's because it's a diff. That's you're solving a Laplace equation. Yeah. So yeah. can that happen here, or do we escape that? So I'm explaining why that happens in the D8 brain case. For the oh, sorry, this the 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 D7 brain case. The reason that that happens is that it's a point like defect in a two-dimensional space, and you're solving the equation of motion for the axion dilaton, which is a dimensionless object. So you get a logarithm. Mm -hmm. And when you get the logarithm, you get scared because it modifies the long distance behavior. And you're completely right. In that case, it has some consequences. But here, the bulk is a unitary CFT where there are no operators of dimension zero, unlike the axion dilaton. I see. And therefore, all the correlation functions decay with some power law. Thanks. That makes sense. OK. So, you're never, so at long distances, you're never worried about these issues. Could I also ask, uh, so the sets, uh, does it uh, depend on more than just delta? So it also knows about correlation functions of higher than two point function. Oh, th this is just the perturbation in the ultraviolet. Once you add the perturbation, you're talking about this uh, power here, right? Yes, yes. So we start from a conformal defect. We add the perturbation with a tiny, with some coefficient. So this is just the mass dimension of that coefficient. We just add the perturbation and it starts flowing and the flow will be very complicated. It will generate many operators on the defect like any renormalization group flow. You, you just trigger it by one operator, but then it does something that's usually very hard to track. This is just the perturbation in the UV. Of the... So if, if you knew all correlation function in, in the uh, initial fixed point, uh, will you be able to relate it to S? Uh, this is, this is, in principle, yes, but in practice, nobody can do it even for bulk RG flows. You can ask, can I somehow using the UV correlators of n equals four super young mills uh, understand the flow to n equals two star? Mm. Maybe no. Maybe you need really infinitely many of them and you need to know integrated correlation functions. So this is very difficult. Yeah, just in one D it could be simpler. Too. Maybe uh, yes, I'm not saying no. I'm saying maybe it's maybe there are cases where it's integrable and so on and so forth. But I'm just saying in principle, it's a very hard question. It's, and also, this observable is kind of difficult to observable. It's, uh, so, okay. Okay, now comes an important point. If there are no more questions. Yeah, can, can I ask a question just to understand? So, I mean, do you assume that there is a consistent theory on the line alone? Because maybe I don't understand, but the, if you say RG flow on the line, does it mean that there is a full theory with all its operators and the flow is only happening there? Or is it is it not a requirement? Or, so Just to understand this RG flow in the usual way, I understand it in a QFT. Right, so these line defects live in an ambient CFT, right? So if you just if you have nothing in the bulk, then it's just quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, there are no interesting RG flows. Or mm -hmm. so here, the line defect is part of a bulk, and the local operators on the line are sometimes induced from the bulk operators. And there are correlation functions between operators on the line and operators in the bulk. So this is like really an impurity that lives in some kind of a, a bulk critical point. It's not isolated by any means. So the renormalization group flow on the line definitely affects the bulk. Okay. So bulk one point functions will evolve and so on. Okay, okay. Okay. It's not an isolated quantum mechanical RG flow. It's really something that's embedded in the bulk. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Sorry, may I ask why this um s is a function of m zero times r? Why it can't be a function of some other things? Well, in this little setup, I have one operator that triggers the RG flow. And so there is a mass scale that's induced by on the line in the RG flow on the line, which is M naught. So S has to be a function of R and M naught, and it has to be a dimensionless function. So it can only be a function of the product being that it has to be dimensionless. Oh, thank you. All right, so for conformal line defects, there is a very important technical thing that will help to understand some subsequent claims, which is that there is no energy momentum tensor uh, on the defect. So what do I mean by that? So physically in condensed matter, that means that you cannot localize energy on the impurity if the impurity is critical. Why is that? It's because the energy momentum tensor on the line defect will have one index because it's a one dimensional defect. So it's only TTT where T is lit little t is the time coordinate on the defect. But if the defect is conformal, it has to be traceless. And if you have an energy momentum tensor that's traceless and only has one index, it has to identically vanish. So intuitively, that means that there is no way to support localized energy on conformal defects. This is emphasized in this paper. I'm just saying technically that there is no such thing as an energy momentum tensor on the defect. That's what I'm saying technically. This is true for conformal defects. If the defect is non-conformal, so as soon as we add the perturbation, uh, this is no longer true. You can localize energy on the defect. There is an energy momentum tensor on the defect. But for conformal defects, there is none. So let me just quote the main result of the, of the first paper that I mentioned at the beginning. So we were able to derive uh, some kind of formula for how the defect entropy changes when you change the mass scale of the RG flow. Now, this is actually not a very illuminating way to write it. I should have written RDR. But MDM is the same as RDR. Remember that this is a function of the product only. So if you want to understand how the expectation value of the Wilson line evolves when you change the radius of the Wilson line or the defect, you just think about it as RDR. It's the same as M0, DM0. So let me unpack this formula. So this is just the radius of the loop. We need it for dimensional analysis. This is an integral over the angles, over the angle. This is an integral over the angle on the loop. This is a two-point function of the energy momentum tensor of the line defect. And this little symbol C means that it's connected. So we throw away the one-point function. And then there is a very interesting modulating factor, which is one minus cosine of the angle difference. This is a sum rule, or you can think about it as some kind of rule. It's a gradient formula rule. It tells you how the entropy changes when you change the radius a little bit. I'm going to explain how we proved it just qualitatively, but the bottom line of this expression is that first of all, the right hand side is completely finite. Why is it finite? Because singularities appear when the energy momentum tensors come close. But then when they come close, this has a double zero and it kills all the possible singularities. Secondly, this function is positive definite or ne non-negative definite. And also in unitary theories, two point functions are positive definite or non-negative definite at separated points. How so do you normalize two point function? Can you say again? How do you normalize a two point function? It's like non ambiguous. Uh, right. So TD is the energy momentum tensor on the line defect. So it has an interpretation of energy density. So that gives a preferred definition of what you mean by TD. You can normalize it from the bulk energy momentum tensor, for instance, because they can exchange energy. So when you exchange one unit of energy with the bulk, it gives you the normalization of TD. OK, so this is a formula. I'll explain briefly how we proved it. But the consequence of this formula is that S must actually monotonically decrease as you change the radius. So as you increase the radius from small to big, uh, the defect entropy will monotonically decrease. And therefore, also the G functions satisfy this inequality. All right, so it's a it's a it's a theorem about the fact that uh, impurity flows or Wilson line flows must be non-reversible. But it's more than just non-reversibility. There is a concrete gradient formula. So every step of the way, uh, the derivative is positive or negative. I'm going to explain now qualitatively how this is proven. What are the steps that you need to take to prove this formula? 
And then we'll go over lots of examples with, without supersymmetry from condensed matter and so on. But right hand side also depends on uh, the scale, right? So it's nonlinear, highly nonlinear equation. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. So this two point function is measured on a line whose radius is um, R. So this explicitly depends on the radius. So of course, yeah, we cannot solve the right hand side. But you can see something fun, which is that for conformal line defects, if there is no perturbation, then TD vanishes. This is true because of what I said here for conformal line defects. So we get a consistent thing. For conformal line defects, the left hand side vanishes. And indeed, the defect entropy is just a number. It doesn't change as we change the radius of the loop. So it's just a silly consistency check. So Alex, if there are no questions about the formula, I'll explain how, what's the main idea of how you derive this formula. So the main idea Sorry. is uh, maybe something that you're familiar from, with from other, from other uh, tricks that people did in QFT uh, for various results. So instead of thinking an RG, about an RG flow that preserves the time translation symmetry on the defect, you can just imagine some kind of time dependent RG flow where you add a mass term that depends on time. So the time dependence of the mass term is called the dilaton. It's just a classical field. It's not a quantum field. It's just a prescribed function of time. So we're doing a time dependent perturbation on the line. It's just a, a Gedanken experiment that would be useful to derive some identities that you imagine a time dependent RG flow. And now the main, the main result comes from the following thing. You take the conformal charges. This is just a standard conformal charge in the d-dimensional CFT. It's in all the books on CFTs that you know. You take a conformal killing vector, you take the energy momentum tensor of the bulk and you integrate on a surface. But now for a circular defect, we take the surface to be a torus that wraps the defect. So we integrate and we ask, what can it be in the presence of the line inside the torus, okay? So on the one hand, it's obvious that this has to vanish because you can take the torus to infinity and kill the vacuum because the CFT is, is still in the uh, ground state at infinity. So on the one hand, it has to vanish. On the other hand, when you collapse the torus around the line, you get a new line. What do I mean by a new line? You get a line which will have a different classical profile phi of t. So you start from a line with some given profile phi of t for the RG flow. You collapse the torus on the line, you get a new profile. And this gives you some relations between correlation functions, infinitely many relations between correlation functions. And one of those relations will be that. So that's the main idea of the proof that this object must still vanish when it drops the circular line defect. Okay. Sorry. Uh, can, yeah. I, can I ask, what did you say when the defect was conformal? I, I'm... Oh, I'm, you, um, uh, are you, sorry, are you asking about this? For, uh, sorry, are you asking about this formula? Yeah. Okay. Uh, is this you? I just recognize the voice. No, this is, sorry, this is a Gerald Block. Oh, sorry, okay. Um, so for conformal defects, um, <clears throat> the energy momentum tensor on the defect must vanish. And physically, this means that the defect cannot store energy. And the reason that this is true is because if the defect preserves SL2R, then the energy momentum tensor of the defect must be traceless. And it has only one index, so it has to vanish. No, but you said in, in something about the perturbation that there is that an implication for this formula, which uh, I didn't Oh, know. I'm just saying that if, if, if you're talking about conformal line defects and there is no perturbation, so this doesn't exist. So this is oh, zero, okay, absolutely fine. Okay. Then this vanishes and we just get a consistent trivial result that the defect entropy is well-defined just as a number. It doesn't depend on the radius or the map. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thanks. It's just a silly, silly consistency check. There is okay. nothing. Thank you it. very much. Sorry. Hey, Zohar, uh, can, you, can you go back on how you deform this torus in, when it ran in three dimensions? It's. Can right. you so, okay, this, this requires some mental imagination. I didn't, I was not able to draw a picture, but I think some of my collaborators were able to. So, the way you see that this torus can be collapsed at, like, Acted up or acted acting at infinity and just you can get rid of it is that 
you can think about the torus as a difference between a sphere inside the line defect and a sphere outside. The difference I mean in the sense of integrals. If you integrate some conserved quantity, such as the conformal charges, on a sphere inside the line defect and a sphere outside of the line defect, the difference of two spheres is a torus, right? Because you can bring the spheres close and just annihilate everything outside of a torus. Okay, so first you write the torus as a difference of two spheres. Then the sphere that's inside, you just collapse it. It acts on the unit operator and there is nothing there. The sphere outside likewise acts at infinity where there is nothing. So I claim that this identity is true whether or not the line defect is conformal, it doesn't matter. It's always zero. And the point is to use this in the other direction of collapsing the torus on the line defect to create a new line defect with some other classical profile, phi of t. That's the idea. Is that a little clear or not so much? Still couldn't imagine it, but I guess I'll have to believe you. Um, Let me just think if I. Maybe I'll look for a picture at the end of the talk that is more illuminating than my explanation. OK. Is it in 3D or the, you have a problem? Not of it's in any dimension. This is true in any dimension. I guess the point is that when you collapse the two sphere, you'll change the topology, but not the quantity. Yes. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. Yeah, when you take the difference of two spheres, you can change the topology because you just take the region that is like, um, I just, it's hard to explain in words. Um, but it's like the difference of two contours. You just cancel it. You can, the, the difference of two contours can be written as a, some kind of closed contour. So this is like the closed contour. So think about this closed contour as like some kind of discontinuity. And you can think about it as the discontinuity from a sphere inside the loop and a sphere outside of the loop. So the discontinuity between these two contours is the little torus, right? It's always like that. Then you take two contours, the difference is the discontinuity over, over the branch cut. So here the branch cut is the line defect essentially. But each of the torus is vanishing on its own. Yeah. So sorry, can you comment why it's vanished at infinity? I mean, like, uh... Circle around uh, electric charge, it doesn't vanish at infinity, right? It computes electric charge still. That's correct. But so what, what assumption is used? OK, so, um, so to see that so this is a circular line defect. So if you want to use the analogy of charge, this has zero charge. But just to your point, um, the best way to understand why what I said is true is to go to radial quantization. There you evolve from the vacuum, then at some fixed radial quantization time, you have a line defect, and then you go to infinity. So you project on the vacuum again. It's just because time evolution in radial quantization projects to the vacuum at the very end. Just because, as you know, the, the spectrum on the D, D minus one dimensional sphere in radial quantization is gap. So when you evolve long enough, you just get the vacuum. So there is some uh, nice picture by Amit if anyone wants to see. <laughs> Where is that? Amit said? Oh. I the video just. Oh, thank you, Amit. This is great. I see it. I see it. I'm sorry that my drawing skills are so limited. OK, so given this, you can try to understand what does this mean. This, this is the equation, the basic equation. It's a nice equation something equals to zero. So it means that actually line defects with classical profiles phi, which are different and they are related in this way, are the same. What do I mean by the same? They, the, the, so if you take two RG flows with some classical phi, phi function that uh, modulates the RG flow, you, took, you take some phi twiddle, which is not the same as phi, but it's different by this quantity, it will be the same physics. Now, what alpha is just an infinitesimal parameter because we're looking at charges, so everything is infinitesimal. Xd is a killing vector, and phi is the function. So it's kind of a funny relation. From given phi, you take this uh, killing vector, restrict it to the line, and you combine it, and you get a new function. So by choosing phi of t to be a cosine, and choosing the killing vector Cd to be the cosine on the line, there is such a killing vector whose projection on the line is a cosine, 
you just get this identity. It says that the one point function of the defect energy momentum tensor operator is the same as some integrated two point function with some cosine. And you see, it's very close to what we need. So there is one more step that is uh, not very illuminating to show, and you get this identity. Uh, In principle, there could be also one point function of uh, like higher line deformation type of operator, right? With some contact term. Right, but this equation is correct including all the contact terms you're saying that maybe what you're saying is that the two-point function has contact terms and you're completely correct about that but this equation the contact terms in correlation functions of the energy momentum tensor are fixed by diffeomorphism invariance so this is all uh, contained here and using this equation you it's just one more little step you derive that you see that it says also a cosine so this is the origin of the cosine it's because we take an energy flow that is cosine to derive this identity of course the final result is just a standard energy flow that what experimentalists do like this it has no cosines but to derive the equation we imagine first that the energy flow has a cosine modulation okay so this leads to that uh, which is this gradient formula and now there was a question about d equals two. So the fact that G U V is bigger than G infrared was conjectured by Affleck and Ludwig already 30 years ago in 91. They did not talk about the gradient formula. They just conjectured based on the Kondo effect and some other things that this is true in 2D. And then there was a paper by Friedan and Konechny which proved the 2D result. So here, this is you can view it as a generalization to any number of dimensions of line defects in any number of dimensions, but we also have this gradient formula. Uh, so it's not just a statement about GUV bigger than G infrared. So this is a, more, a concrete formula that's valid in any dimension. Sorry, Zora, could I ask a question? Uh, so, so, so if you have a conformal line defect, let's say in the UV and you make one of these perturbations, is it ever possible uh, for, for this defect to flow to something topological? And yes. if so, does your, so, so your, your GUV bigger than or equal to GIR say in, in two plus one D, I guess, forbids this from happening for things that have G less than one, let's say, is that right? Indeed, indeed, this is an excellent comment. In fact, in the discussion, if you're interested, we're exactly working on that now. We have some line defect in two plus one D for which we can argue that it cannot flow to a topological line because it starts in the UV with a little bit less than one. So interesting. You, yeah, so that's exactly how we prove that certain line defects cannot be trivial by this uh, hierarchy of Gs. But as a matter of principle, in the condo effect, the SU2 level one version or SU2 level K version of the condo effect, there are many examples where line defects flow to topological lines in the infrared. So they start off with G bigger than one and they flow to G equals one. Can I ask? Um... Yeah, yeah, sure. It's just a naive question. So I, I understand that the cosine serves you good in the sense that it gives you one minus cosine, so that is positive and gives you this monotonicity. But could you have chosen something different? Because it seems like it's a choice of the, the dilaton profile. You could have chosen yeah. something. Else. Yeah, it's an excellent question. I don't actually have a good answer. We played with a few things. Some of them seem to give some new identities. Some don't. Actually, you can also use this formula for, let me just say another thing since you asked. I mean, it's a good question and I don't have a good answer. So I'll say something stupid. Uh, you can also take killing vectors. We only played with killing vectors, which become parallel uh, tangent to the line when restricted to the line. So that's important because we wanted things to act on the line defect without changing this, the circular shape of the line defect. But if you allow for more general killing vectors, conformal killing vectors that have normal components, you'll also get identities that involve the displacement operator because that means, okay, and there are like infinitely many identities that this leads to, and I have no idea if they're useful in principle. Okay, so we okay. just focused on one that seemed useful, and that's it. But could it be useful to generalize this when it's not an exact circle, but maybe with weekly, or it's not that way? Well, it's I have no idea. Okay. I have no idea. I am just saying that this formula is true for any C, and also once you add a dilaton, you'll get just a huge amount of sum rules. Whether mm. any of these sum rules is useful, I have no idea. Thank you. And fun consequence is that sometimes defect conformal filters have an exactly marginal operator. I'll show you some examples. And then it follows that G cannot depend on it. 
because if G depended on it, it would violate the hierarchy between Gs since you can flow back and forth. So G must be independent of exactly marginal operators, which is not easy to prove actually using standard techniques. Okay, now I'll get to the first example, or should we take Just a break? Just a second, uh, Zohar, we are now in the time of coffee break, so maybe it is a good point to, to make a small break. Okay. Um, yeah, we can make a break and then I'll do three examples in the second half. Great. So, colleague, can you pause? Um, yeah, please. Okay. Are there any questions about the previous part? All right. So now I'll talk about a, a flow that a, a, a simple reason. Well, I should have started. Let me start from, let me just change the order. I'll start from the very simplest possible RG flow among line defects and then go to the Wilson loops. I'll change the order of my slides. So we start from free filter in the bulk in uh, D dimensions, D space time dimensions. Uh, even though it's a free filter in the bulk, it could admit potentially non-trivial line defects. I'll give an example later of such a thing. But uh, the very trivial thing that you can do is you say, okay, a, a free filter in the bulk in particular has a trivial line defect where there is nothing. And on that trivial line defect, the spectrum of local operators is the spectrum of bulk operators. And in particular, phi is relevant for any number of dimensions smaller than four because phi has dimensions smaller than one in the bulk for any number of dimensions uh, smaller than four. So this is the simplest line defect you can imagine. You can write it as a Wilson line. Um, it's just an exponential of I phi. So it's just an exponential of I phi. I'm writing it in the chat since I forgot to put this formula in the slides. This is just the Wilson line. It doesn't even require a, I mean, there is time ordering as usual. So it's a pass ordered exponential. It's a completely solvable. It's everything is free. You can resum all the diagrams. Uh, this is the simplest example where you see that the stray defect and the circular defect are not the same. People usually talk about Wilson loops in N equals four and the famous beautiful paper of Nadav and David and Zarem Bobby. But I mean, it happens already here. So if you want to understand that business, that's the point. That's the, that's the simplest thing to study. Okay, but for a circular defect, there is no issue. You can solve, it's a classical field theory problem because everything is quadratic. We computed the defect entropy. It just has a bunch of gamma functions. And uh, as I previously emphasized, it must be a function of the product of the RG scale and the radius of the loop. And there is some four minus D. Nicely, this coefficient is always negative for any D smaller than four. So it actually decreases. And indeed, you can check the sum rule you can see that our formula for the connection to this modulated integral over T dt is correct. You just see that in the UV, the defect entropy goes. Oh my God, what did I do? That's so bad, all these typos. This is again the typo that I made found. So when the radius goes to zero, the defect entropy is zero, not one. You see it from this formula. When D is smaller than four, when R goes to zero, it goes to zero. So the defect entropy is zero and the G function is one. And when we go to infinite radius, the defect entropy is minus infinity. So it flows to zero, not one, to minus infinity. I'm sorry for the typo again. <coughs> this seems a little sick. It's an RG flow that starts at a trivial line and flows to minus infinity. It seems a little sick that it goes to all the way to minus infinity. It doesn't actually stop at the defect CFT in the infrared. We believe that it's a consequence of the fact that the filter in the bulk has a modulate space of Bakwa. So we believe, though we didn't prove it, it's just a conjecture that this effect that the defect entropy goes to minus infinity is only possible when there is a bulk modulate space of Bakwa. Another trivial thing that happens in this example that was emphasized by Kapustin is that if you set D equals to four, this is an exactly marginal perturbation. You can just put an arbitrary coefficient 
And as I said, the G function cannot depend on it. And indeed, you find that the defect entropy, if you go back to this formula, you set D equals four, you find that S is just zero always. So uh, G is one and S is zero. And it's uh, consistent with it being an exactly marginal. Okay, so this example is very nice. It's solvable, but it's a little quirky in that, that it goes to minus infinity and the RG flow never stops. Sorry, there is something in the chat. Oh, and the, the, the flow never stops, but it's probably a, an artifact of this modular space. Now, let me go to n equals four. Can I, can I yes. just ask a question? Sure. Uh, but if D is not equal to four, then this deformation doesn't preserve conformal invariance. So why would you expect a line and a circle to be the same? Oh, I didn't say that. This oh, is just no, a, you, you this is just a massive uh, this is just a massive perturbation of a defect. And I proved the formula that if you do a massive deformation of a defect, you can still define the defect entropy, which is what we call S, and that must monotonically decrease. And at the end points no, of the you had a comment on... yes, you had a Sorry. comment that uh, this is like a simple example where you see the difference between the line and the and the circle. But I, I don't. Oh, I meant. Oh, sorry, I misspoke. I meant that only in d equals four. In strictly okay. d equals four, this is a conformal line perturbed defect for any coefficient. You can add dt phi with any coefficient. And in d equals four, it's a conformal line defect with any coefficient. And, and but the, the difference is always zero. And I'm just saying that, or in that case, you can already see that there are some issues with the straight line. So I would normally expect of you to form a trivial defect with a with a relevant operator, you'd end up with something that divides the space in two in two dimensions. So you just cut the space in half in two dimensions. Uh, I'm not quite clear what the, what the equivalent would be in higher dimensions. Okay, uh, this is a very good comment, but I don't think it's... Mm, okay, it's a very... You, you have some um, very good intuition that you're bringing up. Um, in general, I believe you can flow... In, let me just say, say something general about two dimensions. In two dimensions, there are lots of conformal defects where G is smaller than one. And adding uh, an operator that's integrated on the trivial defect can take you to any of those. Now, you can, you can say that they somehow divide space into two in one plus one dimensions, because you can obtain these interfaces sometimes by fusion of two boundary states of the Cardi type. Maybe that's what you meant by dividing the space into half? Yes, that's a typical endpoint. Uh, do you actually have a reference? Can you write it in the chat? That I, I don't know if this is always true. I understand your intuition from some example that I looked at, but I don't actually know if it's always true. Namely, that all the G smaller than one interfaces, which are possible in one plus one dimensions, are fusions of boundary states of the Cardi type. I don't actually know that this is true. I actually was looking for reference. See if you could write, if you give me a reference, I'll be very grateful. But yes. Um, that definitely doesn't happen in higher dimensions. You can integrate on a line various operators, and it's definitely not going to divide the space into two. You will get some non-trivial DCFTs with G smaller than one. <clears throat> OK, so this was the trivial example, though it has some quirkiness that I think is very rare. It's only happening in some bad models. Now let me get to a more maybe more familiar uh, flow. This is, there is a one parameter family of Wilson lines that we can define in n equals four super young Mills theory. I don't have to explain in this audience uh, this construction. Basically zeta is the coefficient of the scalar, the scalar from the vector multiplet in the exponent. When you set zeta to one, it's the supersymmetric loop, which is a half BPS of Maldacena Wilson. And when zeta is zero, it's just the ordinary Wilson loop. In a very nice paper of Polchinski and Sally, they have argued that zeta is in fact a parameter that flows. So it's exactly a setup of the kind that I'm talking about. The Wilson line is some line defect and zeta is a relevant parameter near zeta equals zero. Near zeta equals one, zeta becomes an irrelevant parameter. And this is the beta function of zeta. You can compute it. 
Um, so we see that, that zeta equals zero, the beta function is negative and it starts an RG flow and then it stops at zeta equals one. This is known only at weak hoop coupling. Maybe recent progress on integrability has extended it. But I, as far as I know, also from Beccaria, John Bitzaitlin, this kind of object is only known at weak coupling at the moment. This is in the planar limit, by the way. I actually believe that nobody even did this exercise away from the planar limit, though it's completely well defined and it should work. So at the moment, my knowledge is that this flow was studied only in the planar limit at weak Hooft coupling, but to all orders in zeta. And uh, in this setup, you can check everything I said. We use the paper of Beccaria, John Bitzaitlin to compute this two-point function of the defect energy momentum tensor, and we reproduce the flow of the entropy, which you can compute exactly. You can compute that weak Hooft coupling. It's just a standard diagrammatic computation. So in this example, it, it works very nicely. This is for the fundamental representation. We did not try to go beyond the planar limit, nor did we try to go beyond the fundamental representation, just because we didn't see results in the literature and it requires some computations of this sort. Okay, so these two examples, just consistency checks. Hey, Zohar, how are you doing? This is Lance. Hi. May I ask a quick question about that? Oh, sure. You might have thought that in one loop, uh, the only color structure you could get is the Casimir in the fundamental, which, which would extend it from large n to any n, like, you know, nc squared minus one, n squared minus one over two nc. Yeah. Is that not true? You're are completely you... right. You're completely right that this is true. Okay. But Usually it's pretty uh, easy to go just... to full NC at low orders. It's harder at higher orders. <laughs> well, but there are two issues here. One is there is okay. the N in the bulk, and yeah. the other is the representation on the line. So it might be a mixture of the CA and the CF. Right. Yeah. Okay. You know, even like basic questions as to which loop is the UV DCFT and which one is the infrared, you need the sign. And I actually don't know. Okay. I think it's not known for large representations or away from the planar limit. You're completely right that only some Casimirs may appear at one loop, but I have not fixed the coefficients. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry the, for my our laziness, but I'll tell you what we're actually doing nowadays. Um, now, this is the work in progress. So we found some example that's extremely interesting to us. I'll try to explain to you why this is interesting. This is something that's very important also in condensed matter physics. So with one scalar field, I wrote this Wilson line, which was trivial, just exponential of I phi, and we solved it exactly. You can compute G, you can compute whatever you want, and the defect entropy went to minus infinity. But there is a very interesting example where you have three scalar fields, okay, peculiarly, and you just think about their index as an SO3 index. This was studied in lots of condensed matter literature, but we're in particular using these papers. Okay, by Sajdev and his collaborators, some very recent paper by Vishwanath, Metlitsky, some early paper by Sengupta. And in this theory, though it's completely free, there is a non-trivial line defect, which is the pass order, the exponential of I zeta, where zeta is an arbitrary coefficient. And now you combine these phi A fields with SU2 matrices, which are in a 2S plus one times 2S plus one dimensional representation. So it's a Wilson loop without gauge fields, and you must trace at the end. I'll explain it. Even though there is no gauge symmetry, you still have to trace, and I'll explain soon why you have to trace. So physically, what does this describe? Why are condensed matter people interested in that? This describes a magnet where you put a high spin S at some point on the lattice. Uh, this could be an atom of a very large spin. Okay. So this is just the Heisenberg Hamiltonian, though we take the bulk to be free for simplicity. Uh, and you put at some point on the lattice uh, some spin S. So you get this kind of thing and it's actually not solvable even though the bulk is completely free, which is surprising. Let me explain why you need to trace. So as I said, this describes a spin S impurity in a ferromagnet. <clears throat> this defines some SU2 matrix in the 2S plus one dimensional representation. Uh, of uh, SU2. But in order for this impurity interactions with the bulk to preserve SU2, you must trace because that's how this impurity would transform under SO3. It transforms in the adjoint. So if you want to get 
if you want to couple this impurity to the bulk in an SO3 preserving fashion, you must trace over the 2s plus 1 dimensional representation or the spin s representation, which is what I'm using here as a subscript. So this is kind of a very interesting example of a Wilson line. It has no gauge fields, no gauge fixing, completely free bulk. Still, it's a very deep, very deep and hard problem to solve it exactly. It's not known how to solve it for arbitrary zeta and s. There is no solution. The number of bulk space-time dimensions is going to be taken to be pretty arbitrary d, though most of what I'm going to tell you is about d equals 4. Because for d equals 4, zeta is a nearly marginal operator, and there is a beta function and so on. So let me explain why this is technically difficult. For uh, Maybe for you guys, it will be easy. But for us, when we start drawing diagrams, because of the pass ordering, you get some kind of unwieldy integrals that we don't know how to resum because there are matrices and they don't commute. So it's just hard to resum all the diagrams. Even though the bulk is completely free, there are no bulk loops. Resumming these diagrams looks very difficult. So I'll tell you some things about this model now. Are there any questions about the setup? I'll actually have one. Yes. Uh well, when you say the word uh, spin and magnet, and uh, it looks like very three-dimensional in physics. Yes, we're uh, going to study it in like, our... And then SO3 is the uh, orthogonal group of, of real, real space, and it will rotate also the line itself, okay. right? No, no, no. SO3 is an internal symmetry group that acts on the scalars. So this is a Heisenberg chain in these dimensions, these space-time dimensions. Yeah, so kind of, you cannot sell it like a physical model, right? I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm just saying that... I uh, just felt in this way. Okay, this is the bulk free field theory in the space-time dimensions yeah. with three fields, and the SO3 symmetry is internal. If you want to connect with the theory of magnets, you must plug at the end d equals three. Yeah. So, yeah, but then if, if I plug, then I also have to rotate loop with, uh, which is in line no. with SO3. No, right. no. The Heisenberg magnet has internal SO3 symmetry because it has s dot s interactions, si dot si plus one. Okay. It's an internal symmetry. Oh yeah, <laughs> the American complain about Heisenberg's in chain, which is also not in 3D, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> what do you mean? It's, uh, I'm not talking about the chain, I'm talking about the Heisenberg lattice, the xy model. I'm talking about the two dimensional lattice where at each point on the side, there is a spin to a spin a half and the interaction is si dot si plus one. This is what describes magnets in real life. And uh, that model has internal SO3 symmetry. Mm -hmm. What okay. most of the condensed matter people have done is to study this near d equals 4, because then you can do epsilon expansion. And then they plug d equals 3 at the end. Solving it directly in d equals 3, not known how to do it, OK? <laughs> if it's not about. Hmm? Why, why are you working in particular with SO3 rather than arbitrary flavor symmetry? Yeah, you could do various extensions. You can also like SON, take the large end limit, play with the representations. We just took the simplest possible example um, just to warm up. It's a warm up example. So it's still very difficult. S sorry. I'm going to... Yes. Can I... uh, yeah. <clears throat> I was wondering, you're saying you're working in 4D, but you mean uh, in uh, in epsilon expansion, or you actually mean in 4D this thing will, uh, is in, you know, with a single scalar, you just told us before that this thing is conformal in 4D, right? Right. The, this theory that I taught you, that I told you yeah. about before, it's exactly conformal in four dimensions for any value of the coefficient of, the, of, this, in, of this coupling. Yeah. In this theory, even strictly in D equals four, Zeta will have a beta function. Okay, so you're saying there will be divergences if you start computing diagrams. Yes, uh, this diagram, actually yeah. this one, has a log divergence from some commutator. Okay, so it's, a, it's a very interesting setup where everything seems completely trivial, but yet you have all the all the complications and all the physics that you want to check. And I'm going to say some things about strictly d equals four and also some things about four minus epsilon and even one little thing about d equals three, okay? Okay, thanks. So let me start by making a small comment. This parameter 
is relevant for this smaller than four, classically relevant, just because the dimension of phi is d over two minus one, and it's a little smaller than one for any d that is smaller than four. In d equals four exactly, it was found to be marginally irrelevant. So it actually flows to zero. So the physics in four dimensions is very simple for this impurity. It just flows to weak coupling and it becomes a couple decoupled defect. In other words, zeta just flows to zero and the pass ordered exponential just becomes exactly 2s plus one, which is the size of the representation. Okay. So the physics in strictly d equals four is very easy, just asymptotic, sorry, infrared freedom. So that's what I wrote here. The free decoupled defect is stable in exactly d equals four. You can also try to compute the expectation value of a circle. And these are the, okay, so here I'm just quoting the beta function near d equals four. So I'm working at d very close to four, but like in the wilson fisher technology, we keep the classical piece from d smaller than four, and then we have a big beta function that we must compute. And this is a strictly four dimensional uh, beta function, this zeta cube, is why I said that it's marginally relevant in four dimensions, okay? So this is the big thing. And also log G has some complicated expansion. And you see that the spin uh, of the representation appears in this expansion. And uh, also D minus four appears in various places. And this is the answer at Z equals zero. This is just the trace of the free representation. Log G is just log of the dimension of the representation. Okay, so the UV, has z, z equals zero in four dimensions, then g is just two s plus one, and it's completely transparent and trivial in exactly four dimensions. But as soon as d is slightly smaller than four, like 3.99, you have a non-trivial fixed point. It's obvious from this equation. So there is a conformal defect in this business, just slightly below four dimensions, a non-trivial conformal defect. And it's supposed to be kind of continuously connected to the one that they see in experiment when they put an atom inside the ferromagnet. Okay, so this is what I'm saying here. There is a weakly coupled fixed point where uh, the coupling on the defect is very small. You can compute perturbatively the expectation value on the circle. That's what we did. And happily, it satisfies the G theorem. It's just slightly smaller than the va value of the free defect because of this negative sign. So luckily the G theorem is satisfied. And this fixed point is completely stable for all the, all the perturbations that preserve the internal symmetry, SO3. Okay, so now let me tell you something um, that we're looking at now. You see that this expansion in zeta is kind of interesting, but there are also factors of S. So one thing that we wanted to understand is what happens when the impurity of the, the spin of the impurity is huge. Like if the representation is very, very large. So it's huge, huge matrices. Is there any simplification in the limit where the representation is huge? This is what I called at the beginning, heavy defect, heavy defect theory. This could be interesting even experimentally because you can easily put an atom with spin 100 inside the ferromagnet. So we wanted to understand the phase diagram as S is very, very large. I'll be very brief, but I'll tell you the main idea and how this applies and then also what it means for Wilson loops. So in what I told you so far, S was fixed and epsilon was the smallest parameter, like always in the wilson fisher expansion. But you, if S is very large, you might be worried about various higher order terms because if S, S is too large, they will be more important than the terms that we took into account. And the expansion breaks down when S is of order one over square root of epsilon essentially. So what we did, is essentially to realize that you can resum perturbation theory in some double scaling limit. So you can resum all the diagrams uh, given that you keep this fixed. So you must keep zeta squared S fixed, then take S to infinity and you can resum all the diagrams. This is achieved in a way which is very analogous to if you're familiar with this paper about the large charge limit of the O2 model, it's very similar. You have to, there is a new classical trajectory that appears and the new classical trajectory, I mean a new saddle point. There is a new saddle point when the representation is huge. And this new saddle point allows a resummation of Yeah, something we can't hear you anymore. No, 
How about now? Yeah, it's good. Strange. Uh, I I wonder where 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 did you lose me? Oh, one second before I warned you. Okay. I was just saying that there is a new classical saddle point in the limit of large isospin. We call S isospin, not to confuse with transverse spin. And this new saddle point allows for a complete resummation of the beta function and scaling dimensions and various other observables of this line defect. Sorry, from these two orders, or uh, you computed, uh, I don't see this particular scaling there. It's highly non trivial. From these orders, it seems like maybe you want to take S times zeta fixed. But actually, once you take this fixed, there is exponentiation. So I'll give you, I'll show you now. Uh, let me explain first the idea of how you find the, find the new saddle point for large representations. And then I'll explain what there is some results. So how do you actually try to simplify this problem at large isospin? The idea is to write the world line theory on the isospin using the coadjoint orbit method. So we rewrite the degrees of freedom on the line defect using a first order formalism. We have two we have a very complex variable Z, which is actually a bispinner. And we use a first order kinetic term. This is like a particle in a spherical uh, on a sphere with a magnetic monopole. The advantage of the coadjoint orbit method approach is that the size of the representation comes out of the integral. So here the size of the representation is in the trace and it's hard. But if we write the action on the defect in this way, then S comes out of the integral and it becomes like an effective H bar. So there is a new effective H bar, which is one over the size of the representation. I'm speeding up a little bit. And given that this is true, now you have a classical physics problem. You have to solve the subtle points of free bulk fields coupled to some quadjoint uh, orbit uh, variables. And this is solvable with just classical differential equation. You solve it, it leads to an exponentiation. The reason it leads to exponentiation is because classical action gives you e to the minus one over h bar times the classical action. So it allows to resum the beta function, the g, uh, defect time should be many quantities, this approach, okay? And as I said, it's very similar to how people treat recently the large charge limit of O2 model. So quick question, is this a world line fermion if you understand correctly? This is bosonic. It's bosonic. Yes. It's a first order formalism with X of the type X dot P. Mm -hmm. It's basically an X dot P thing. So the symplectic manifold is, has a finite volume and you have finitely many states in this quantum mechanics. You could think you could also work with fermions, but then it's not as easy to get the S out. To get the S out, you want a sphere so that the, you want to create a sphere whose radius is effectively the size of the representation. It's not clear to me how do you project the specific representation? Mm -hmm. There is a very nice paper of, Israel, of some uh, people from Israel that uh, explain how to get this from uh, gauge, gauge, gauging uh, the SU2 Wesomino model. Okay. So let, just to give you a quick example. So the G function exponentiates, you see logs. So log G is log, log, the G function exponentiates and we computed it exactly in this limit. It's valid for all uh, values of the double scaling parameter sigma zeta squared S. Uh, and this is, I'm showing you the result only in D equals four. We have, but we have the exact result in any dimension, including D equals three, which is experimentally more relevant. <laughs> and this is the answer. You see exponentiation and you, we check the G theorem. Uh, we actually found some new fixed points. So the weak coupling analysis shows that there is a fixed point when zeta squared is of this order. But actually when you do this resummation, you find non-perturbative fixed points too. So this system has more fixed points that the condensed matter people didn't know about uh, that you can see by doing this resummation. They go into infinity when the coupling goes to zero. Or... Uh, these are fixed points with uh, funny values of the double scaling parameter uh, zeta squared s. Uh, well, the usual fixed point is at small zeta squared s, weak toothed coupling, you might say. Uh, we found a new fixed point where this is not small. Okay. 
probably. I want to just say the last thing before I get to the open questions. This, this technology, which you represent Wilson lines by this method and you try to do the larger presentation limit, it works exactly the same also for SU2 gauge theory for n equals four super young meals for Wilson loops. And the main thing we're doing now is to compare results from localization, for instance, just to check that this is all correct. We're trying to compare results from localization to results from this classical saddle point resummation. And we've already managed to reproduce some very nice uh, predictions of localization in the larger presentation limit. So this method works uh, for this uh, SP, this is called sometimes this, this is called in the condensed matter, it's called SPT line defect. So it works the same for SPT line defects and uh, Wilson lines, this method. Okay, I'll finish quickly with some open questions. One minute. So there is obviously this whole thing challenges the connection between entanglement entropy and monotonicity theorems. Because as I said, the G is not the same as entanglement uh, above two dimensions. And there are lots of tech questions you can ask. Uh, is, there, is there a lower bound on G? I showed you an example where it flows to zero or S goes to minus infinity, but maybe there are lower bounds once you assume that the theory doesn't have a modular space. There is a very nice paper about it in the context of D equals two, but they make some extreme assumptions about the bulk, which are not realistic. There is something that ADS-CFT shows, which is called the web flow. This was shown by some papers of Prem Kumar and Silvani. We don't understand it yet, but these are some flows on line defects which are not triggered by an operator. They're triggered by something that they call a web. It would be nice to understand what that means and whether it obeys a G theorem. We proved only a theorem for operator flows. Obviously, you can connect, you can try to con make contact between this large representation limit, large, and there are many such generalizations. People already asked about it. Uh, there are some applications to condensed matter. And finally, uh, even this formula would be nice to understand in ADS CFT. I think it's at the present not under, not known. Sorry, I meant um, I meant this one. Just to see that this is true in ADS CFT would be very nice. But more importantly than that, um, it would be nice to connect to these recent results on the G functions in ADS CFT. Uh, obviously nice to connect to conformal bootstrap where there are lots of papers on defect, defect CFT bootstrap. It would be nice to see if they see these fixed points for the, SP, for the impurities and so on. There are just some open questions. And so thank you. Thank you, Zohar, for a very interesting talk. So let's thank the speaker. And it is time for questions. Yeah, so what are the diagrams in this limit? Um, are you asking about uh, the this? double killing? Yeah. Well, we don't use it, we don't solve it using diagrams, we solve it by finding a new class, a saddle point. Yeah, so but uh, can you trace it back to some particular class of diagrams? Like, uh, normally, it would be some ladders or rainbows. Or... Let me see, is Gabriel here? Gabriel would know the answer better than me. He might have tried. Let's see if Gabriel is uh, I am here, yes. Okay. But I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know the answer. I mean, somehow, as Zor said, if you start just expanding in diagrams, you don't even, you think that perturbation theory should actually break down much earlier. And, uh, even showing this exponentiation that uh, Zor mentioned for the partition function diagrammatically, both in this case, both in the large charge case, which was studied before, I think there is no diagrammatic proof to this stage. Um, plus, you surely integrability technology might help, but it's really quite involved exercise compared to the simple argument uh, from some class. Let me just say, explain what Gabriel said. Gabriel said that if you just look at these terms and you look at a few more, you might think that already when S is of order one over square root of epsilon, the expansion will break down. But actually, Lots of terms cancel out for some reasons that we don't understand. And actually the expansion only breaks down when S is of order one over epsilon, not square root of epsilon. So that technically means that a piece like zeta to the power six, S to the four would not exist. Only zeta to the power six, S squared would exist. So if you keep going more and more and more, 
you would see that there is something going on because you would see that some powers of S don't appear. And maybe you could see exponentiation eventually, but it's not obvious why from the diagrammatic point of view. One fast question. Have you tried to consider instead all representation simultaneously, maybe creating more like fermion and try to generate function for all the representation? This is normally simpler. Mm. Then uh, yeah. going to the by fermion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're saying that if you look at if you put on the Wilson line fermions, then it has many representations. Then it has all the anti-symmetric representations in yeah. one swipe. And you can write a generating functional. It's a yeah, good point. Like typical potential for the presentation. Then you, can, then you can project. But that also yeah, good. it's a very good point. We tried to work with fermions. The advantage of these variables is that they live on a sphere of radius I, of radius uh, s. You see what I'm saying, Amit? Because you want the symplectic manifold to have volume s, so they live on a sphere of volume s, effectively. Mm -hmm. And once the volume of the sphere comes out of the action, you can do an expansion, like we do for a large CP1. With fermions, I don't know how to do the expansion. Yeah, I, I was afraid to try to do it at finite test. But... Ah, you're yeah. suggesting a way of solving the finite test problem. Well, uh, I, I at some point spent probably a few weeks trying to compute diagrams and I gave up. Uh, maybe I'm, I mean, I'm definitely not strong enough to try. The computation of these diagrams is just horrendously complicated. There's a nice technique of going to the by scalar variable. No, I, I mean, you know exponentially more than me about this. So if somebody should try it, it's zero. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, I mean we, 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 using this double scaling limit, we can, we can predict infinitely many terms here. We actually have the exact beta function in this limit as a function of the double scaling parameter. So we have infinitely many terms in some scheme, but we cannot predict all the terms. We can only predict those that survive the double scaling limit. So the exact beta function looks a little bit like NSVZ. It's amusing. It looks like alpha over one plus alpha. That's the exact beta function. Maybe one more fast question regarding one of the points in the conclusions. If you add also a lot of the views of freedom in the bulk, then you get projection to planar diagrams. Can you try that? Is it that comment? Yes. Yeah, we have not tried it. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we're focused on trying to reproduce um, the results of localization from this effective filtery approach. We just tried to look at larger presentations in n equals four super yang mills with gauge group SU2, solve this classical saddle point and compare with localization. We can in principle compute many non-protected quantities too, but we didn't do it yet. Ask a naive question, maybe. Sure. So, what about turning on phi square in D less than equal less or equal than two? Uh, is it not? Hmm. I believe it's always irrelevant, as far as I remember the scaling exponents. Oh, you're talking about bulk free, free field in the bulk. Well, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, I'm talking. Yeah, I thought in the Ising. In the Ising, it's go going to be always irrelevant. Uh, if the bulk is free, then you're right. Yes, uh, you can definitely do that. What it means physically is that it's an impurity where you change the temperature around a few lattice sites, right. whatever that means, because phi squared is the temperature operator. So it corresponds to turning on different temperature around a few lattice sites. So it's like you connect a few lattice sites to a heat bath at a different temperature. So that's how you would realize it experimentally. But I, I have not, we definitely didn't try, or I don't know anything about it. Thanks. I guess you're saying that it's an exactly solvable model. Yeah. 
Is it that what you're three, it, Yeah, yeah, it looks exactly solvable and it would be marginal on equals three. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, we, we didn't think about it. Yeah, it's a quadratic theory. It should be exactly solvable and slightly below three dimensions, it might flow. Right. right. It's a very good point. We didn't think about it. You could probably do it in an afternoon. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Is there is a question? No, so uh, yeah. I guess I can stop uh, recording. If there are like uh, some crazy comments or questions, we can continue for a bit. Yeah.